Finance and Minister uh, a quick update. Today's agenda is a bit different um, due to the potential of the uh, larger conversations around from Corona's team and the Celestia team. Uh, I won't be doing a team update this week, but next week we'll do like a end of quarter update. Um, so please welcome Huang Yi. Yeah, thanks. So I, I'll, be, I'll begin. Um, yep. So this is about the, the uh, we we trying to fix the the uh, bottlenecks, the, the uh, major bottlenecks for scanning. Uh, the most obvious obvious one in our case is the DB size. Uh, our uh, Chronos production chain has run for more than a year now, and it's already. The whole uh, the archive node is or uh, it's approaching three terabytes. It, it sounds like two point six terabytes, I think. And the, the application DB alone is one point seven terabytes. So we try to find the solution for this. And uh, the right now, uh, the solution we deployed and is testing is this version DB. And uh, after. Uh, using this version DB plus, this setup with version DB plus uh, prompt, I will treat the the, the database the, the node uh, is much smaller, and it can still provide uh, historical queries just uh, without Merkle proof. I will talk about the trade off later. Uh, so this this new setup of the node, it can do consensus data machine. And the historic archived historical queries without the Merkle proof. So the version DB stored all the all the historical versions of the key value pairs. Just uh, don't store those Merkle, the hash stuff, the Merkle tree. Just the key value pairs directly. Uh, and uh, it works together with the existing IRL tree. But uh, we recommend you to uh, set the pruning to the IRL tree. So it can also serve the Merkle proofs uh, from the Unpruned IRL versions. So for recent versions, it's just don't serve Merkle proof for older versions, depending on your pruning settings. That's the main, main trade off here. And the advantage is uh, the size, the DB size it is much smaller. And uh, the query performance with, without the Merkle proof part uh, is much better. Then the then query the IRL tree. So how version DB works? Uh, basically, it uh, appends the key, appends the version, or we you can call it time step or version to the key, so you can store multiple versions of the same key in the same database together, and uh, the data, the data, it it also lay out in a way that the different versions of the same key are stored together. So when you query, you uh, you you can seek for the a key value pair. You first seek the key key part, then you uh, uh, seek the 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 version part using the target version. Basically, when you query a, a target version of a key, what you really want is you want to find the version that the key is modified in, uh, which is smaller, less than or equal to the target version, right? You, you want to find the, uh, the, the, the latest change that it happens before the target version. So that is done by uh, by normal database seek op operation or iterate iterations. So you can serve normal uh, point lookups and the uh, iterations on historical versions. Just the uh, no, not the Merkle proof stuff. So current implementation is based on the RuxDB user defined time step. It uh, implements just sim uh, just not as I described, very similar things uh, to that. Uh, also, there is PeppleDB also support something similar, and uh, it potentially can, we, we can explore that 
as well in the future as an alternative backend for this this idea. Uh, actually, originally we there, there is a design that that works on general evaluate database. It's just uh, a we actually did the implementation, but abandoned uh, since we find that RuxDB has some native support for this kind of features. So so we picked we so we just chose the RuxDB for now because uh, the general design would be uh, less efficient than than the native ones. Uh, during the development, actually the lots of effort are put into the migration. The version DB implementation itself is actually pretty simple because since we take advantage of the, the low-level DB support, uh, but migration could be tricky if if your chain is pretty big. Uh, the naive way to mag the migration is always just uh, migrate from the uh, resync from the genesis. That of course always works, but uh, that means if you, if you have many breaking changes in the past, you, you need to patch all those versions uh, to add the version DB feature to, to it. Uh, so we find a way to do the migration directly on the database level. We just uh, so we just developed a set of tools to first e extract the change sets from existing IOWL tree. So you take a archived IOWL tree and you do the diff for each version pairs, find out the changed key value pairs of each version and dump them in the change set files. Then you build the version to be from the change set files. Uh, yeah, that's basically how it works. And uh, so what is mem IOWL then? Uh, mem IOWL actually is, is an idea that developed uh, during the uh, implementation of the version DB idea. Because when we do this change set thing, you know, when we, we realize that the IOWL tree is actually, the change set and the IOWL tree is interchangeable. So you can extract change set from IOWL tree, and you can also replay change set to rebuild the IOWL tree. Any any target version of the IOWL tree, uh, identical one, the root hash would be matched exactly. So we um, we also developed a feature that we you can you can you not only can replay the change set to rebuild uh, in IOWL tree in memory, you can also dump that IOWL tree uh, on disk just uh, one version, one snapshot on this. And uh, that file can be accessed directly using MMAP, just like uh, OS, we just need OS to handle the disk IO, but for the user application, you just treat it next, like uh, in-memory data structure. So we figure that this format of IOWL tree is probably the most, the as but for on disk IOWL tree, this format is probably as efficient as you can get because it works very similar to a in-memory uh, tree data structure. The nodes reference each other by the file offsets very directly, rather than traditional way you you nodes referring is each other. Uh, each node is stored in the general given DB as a separate entry. Uh, th there's many indirections there. So at, we did some benchmarks. So you can see the mem IOWL disk. This this item is the uh, is a M mapped IOWL tree from uh, on disk snapshot file. Uh, you can see it's similar, it's very very close to other uh, in pure in memory data structures next like, next like the B tree. And uh, we also add the some un, some unordered containers into the benchmark game. For example, the LRU cache, which currently used for the inter block cache in current SDK. You can see their performance is quite similar. The only thing that is significantly faster is the GoNan map itself. Uh, so uh, let's say we, we use the mem IOWL design for the to support the consensus state machine, which 
you know, don't, we only need to support the latest version for in, in that use case. Uh, this probably is the, the, as fast as you can get in the uh, IRVL storage. And it can, uh, yeah, and also import export works much faster than the existing ones. Uh, of course, the big trade off here it is so. So, if we adopt this design, we, we would have uh, like uh, different solutions for different rows of a uh, node. It, you, you see, we, we can separate the, the rows of the node like uh, like this. You, the node has a consensus state machine, which always works on the latest version of the state, and the, you, we have. GRPC query service, which provide historical queries, but without the Merkle proofs. But we also need the historical queries with Merkle proofs, like ABCR query, or in the future, maybe uh, need this in GRPC service as well. Uh, so we'll have like different solutions designed specifically for, for different use case. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, is this the, of course, this this is still in design. Version DB is released already, but MM will thing I just de described is still in development. So yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, I also want some feedbacks from the community. Do you think this is the right approach to 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 you know to you achieve? I'm the... um, sorry, finish. Yeah, almost finished. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, uh, I think do, it is. Do you see that? Oh, sorry. Yeah, you go ahead. I'm, I'm finished. I'm finished. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, do you think like the the memorial is more like um, uh, uh, a write through cache that like then the secondary is the secondary like the state before the most recent state gets written to the traditional IBL or is it that like um, all three so like in like let's say store v2 you have the version db and you have the ivl tree and then if then those are like two writes um and if we do introduce like memory ivl is it a third write or is it still only two writes uh uh sorry pardon do you mean it just just like um if when you imagine it is it like there's three separate like um there's three separate like things here like there's ivl version db there's mem ivl or is it like mem ivl is like on top of ivl and then there's version db uh in my imagine uh, uh i mean if we want to achieve the extreme performance of the you know, of, of the chain uh consensus state machine is uh, of course we need to make it uh consensus state machine speed is the speed of block generation so if we really need like uh, extreme tps for the chain we need to make the first we need to make the consensus state machine as fast as possible so mm mmmlvl is is for that so so for like a valid data node you only need mmlvl you don't need anything else like if you don't need to serve the queries you only need them have your alone. But like in, in crash recovery mode, in this sense, like what is like the worst case? Uh, those are handled by, by the change set, uh, store the change set as right ahead lock for the M oh, okay. So, okay. Yeah, maybe so you're I, 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 the change set I, separately. Yeah. yeah, maybe I have skipped that part. So, so the main area is uh, like uh, you combine the snapshot and the, the change sets as the right ahead log. So, for most of the block, you only just store the change set files, uh, store the change set in the right ahead log format. And when you start up, you load the last snapshot and you play those change sets to get the latest area tree in memory. And uh, you can uh redump the snapshot for like ten thousand blocks or, or yeah some configuration the duration to update the snapshot
Yeah, that makes sense. And for re reference, uh, in our current mainnet uh, node, the snapshot is like uh, 14 gigabytes size. And for uh, you opened the PR in this set um, for something uh, and mentioned the size of the snapshots. It seemed like the mem IVL snapshot is ends up being larger than the um, than the normal IVL snapshot. Is that correct? Uh, is uh, is actually a little bit smaller. They are, ah, okay. they are uh, yeah, because the the mem IVL snapshot is uh, more compact because no those in directions they are just for example the node struct is encoded in a sequential way and not in the fixed size array like an array in a m mapped file in a continuous address space and uh, they just re the nodes reference each other by the index in that array and uh, but in in another way it is uh, larger because the key values currently is not compressed at all to achieve this benchmark number. So the key values are also stored in files without any compression right now. But maybe in the future, if the DB size, if the snapshot size is a concern, we we can uh, apply certain compressions as a trade-off between uh, size and uh, CPU performance I, I think it's um like some some chains complain about it and some chains are fine with the import speed and I, there is a PR to like increase the speed and then like the the size of the snapshots usually isn't too large um, it's interesting to hear that you you guys are at 14 gigabytes yeah Any this I, I have like one one more question. Um, but does anyone else have any questions uh, for MemIVL or version DB? Uh, one um, yeah, I was a little bit late, so um, I have one question in fact here. Um, so is it going to be seen that instead of the cache, or rather like complementary to the cache? Do you mean mem area? Yeah, yes, like the, the cache we have today in the store. In, I mean, like the cache which is implemented today in the store. Yeah, uh, yeah. Mem, mem area is a standalone solution. It, it replaces existing area database. And, uh, and the, the relationship with the cache is also interesting because, uh, as you can see in the benchmark numbers, the mem area itself, the query performance itself is already very fast, like it's as fast as the B tree, if the B tree is, is the same size of the mem area tree. Because area tree is in itself is a search tree. You don't, right? B tree the, the, is almost in the same structure as the, those in memory uh, searching right. data structures. Uh, so, yeah, the relationship with the catch storage is is the catch is fa is significantly faster or not if, if the catch is significantly fast faster then maybe it's more it is it, it's more useful As, otherwise right, so the yeah, memory itself I mean, is fast enough yeah there's this ongoing work yes to rework how the cache is working right because there is this like whole ladder of inter i mean of of wrappers, yes, which can basically slow down the cache. Yeah, but it could be also interesting, basically, to add an option like with the store version two, or what, however it's called now, to um to make the cache optional if we want to adapt uh, in my deal. Yeah, yeah. And the current cache store, it also has the issue that. Uh, each layer of the catch store will catch the same stuff, so that also something to uh, good to be optional. And uh, another thing about the memory area about the catch is the 
the mem areas catch is totally uh, managed by the OS page catch. There's no other catch at all because all those are directly accessed. Currently, no compression at all. So compared to other uh, key value databases, they all, they also need those block catch. You 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 need the OS page catch. You also need the uh, block catch that uh, catch the uh, decompress the stuff. So with mem area, we don't have that either. There is only OS page catch. Do you have a performance so of any code? Uh, uh, do you have a, a benchmark of um, mix load? Yeah, like when, the, mix when, it's not, when it's not fully catched by the OS, you, do you mean that? No, 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 like the benchmark where you have the load of mix, uh, store, and get operations. Uh, mix, store, and uh, nope. This, this benchmark is about the uh, Insert, insert uh, uh, a million random key value pairs, then benchmark the get operation. Ah, okay, because it's a query. Oh. Yeah, just query. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, probably like, the better would be to have some mix load, so both inserts and queries. Yeah, currently we are doing the integration with Cosmos SDK and try to run some node on production to see how it works. Awesome, yeah, I think the I think there's like another use case um, for MemAVL here that the second speaker of this call um, might find it interesting. I'm not sure if he's on the call, but like for like fraud probability for um, to be able to like reconstruct the tree um, at a later point, um, instead of like using the IVL on disk, they could just like do it in memory um, uh, a lot faster. Yeah, that could make sense. Mm -hmm. Awesome. The, the other question that I kind of had is like, um, above you said like, uh, Pebble to be supported. Like um, I know we talked about the um, Pebble having like some support uh, for something like this. Um, have you been like experimenting with it, or have you like found anything else? Uh, is that a question for me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry, can you, can you uh, say again? Oh yeah, just just like um, have you like uh, you mentioned above um, on like Pebble DB support and stuff like that? Um, then uh, uh, like if you just have been like playing around with like Pebble as a replacement for like rocks in this sense or or not? Yeah, I haven't done the uh, fully integration. I only tried. I only tried that the is. MVCC example showed in the repository that uh, it seems to do the same thing as the uh, as the RuxDB user time step feature. Yeah, but I haven't do the full full thing. Currently, I just uh, we just done the Pebble DB integration in the draft PR, and uh, to see how Pebble DB works in general first. Awesome, awesome. Do you have anything else that you'd like to add, Hongi, or any final questions? Awesome. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Hongi, to for coming and talking about this. Um, it's super exciting. Also, the benchmarks are fun to see. Um, so our next speaker is Manev from Celestia. And he'll be talking about uh, fraud proofs within the Cosmos SDK. Whenever you want to take it away. Yep. Yeah, I can take it away. Hey, everyone. Uh, share my screen.
Yeah, so I did this presentation internally first um, for stage propers. So this is the same slides, um, just to be using them. Um, yeah, to get right into it, um, go over just like the outline. The main, main, main things to talk about is like how to detect fraudulent state transitions, uh, generating state fraud proofs, and then verifying them in the SDK. Um, so a lot of it is like from parts of section four of the original like Celestia white paper, uh, just for background. Um, yeah, optimistic rollups and RS minorities. I'm sure I'll just skip over the, the obvious parts. Um, for the wor workflow of fraud proofs, here's assuming there's like um, five main actors. Yes, there's a user who sends a, sends a transaction. There's an aggregator or a block producer who is generating blocks. Uh, it's constructing blocks. So those are gossiped, uh, let's say, to the full nodes. And the validating full nodes will be uh, like its equivalent to in Pendermint, for example, you had uh, apply block. So you are applying the block and applying the or updating your local state machine with those state transitions. So during then, you can uh, detect invalid state transitions, is, the, is what I'll go into next. But you'll detect invalid state, uh, state transitions. If there is one, you would generate a fraud proof, gossip it to like clients. And ideally, a like client who has no state at all should be able to um, use this fraud proof to verify um, and run exactly one state transition and uh, be able to verify that that state transition was indeed false or, or, fra uh, or fraudulent. So that's the workflow. Um, any questions so far? Let's stop here. Um, okay, let's move on. So let's move on to detecting fraudulent state transitions. So for now, it's uh, implemented. Uh, with the IABL trees. Um, so just background over there is, uh, we have a multi-store. So there is, um, um, we have one big mer Merkle tree for the whole store. So where each, where keys are module names and value are the Merkle roots of the module tree. And again, for each module, we have a IABL tree with actual key value pairs of um, like arbitrary key value pairs. So that's the multi-store, right? Um, now, in order to detect fraudulent state transitions, we, um, in our, um, we define like this notion of an intermediate state root, which is so cu currently in Fosmos SDK, an app hash is generated after you call commit, right? So you would uh, call commit and you would get an app hash that th this is the commitment after of the whole state to, to the whole state. But uh, in order to detect state transition, uh, fraudulent state transition between delivered transactions or like uh, between begin block or end block, uh, we have a notion of an intermediate state route. So you need a working state route of the app. Uh, after a single transaction is applied. So in this case, you need to, um, I guess, in this case, you would write the, you would also, after each deliver TX, you would update uh, the, or you would, you would write that state um, on disk. So it's reflected in the app hash as well. Uh, so for now, we just uh, added uh, for this experimentation purposes. We just added uh, get app hash method. This can be a ABCI query as well uh, okay, later on, but this just uh, provides a way to extract an app hash from the app after like a single transaction is applied. Um, so that's what we have. So you generate an ISR after each of these ABCI method calls. So in apply block in Tendermint, for example, with you would have 
uh, begin block, deliver TX end block. So I would just check the app hash after each begin block. So I'll just go to that next slide. Um, so the block producer would, I let's say this is how uh, the block data looks like. And you would put in the intermediate state routes while you are generating um, the block. You would po populate the intermediate state routes. So after begin lock, you would get an ISR. After each deliver TX, you get an ISR and put them in the block data. And the validating full nodes will just cross check this. They will all generate their own ISRs and compare it against the ones in the block data. And if there's a mismatch, that's how you like would detect that there's invalid state position. So you're basically ch checking the, the the app hash or the commitment to the state is different after a certain state transition was applied. So that is how you're detecting fraudulent state transitions um, from an ABCI client perspective. Um, so I'll stop here. Anyone wants to interject? Any questions? It might make sense to also add that um, like, in, like the intermediate state routes versus like a block level fraud proof is the, is entirely like the size of the fraud proof. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, on a, for, a, for a block level fraud proof, you would not need ISRs. You would just, you can just use the app hash um, that is already existing after commit. Um, yeah, so you don't really need that. Um, you could just have one after all the transactions. So that's how you would you are in that in that case you're detecting fraudulent block instead of like fraudulent state transition. Um, yeah. Um, moving on, we to actually generate a state fraud proof. This would actually happen inside the SDK. Uh, so the SDK just needs to know what state transitions, like um, the list of all non-fraudulent state transitions and plus the fraudulent state tra transitions. Um, so for now, we just have this. Um, these are the parameters that it takes. It just takes the begin block requests and all the deliver TX requests up to the fraudulent state transition. Um, so last non-nil state transition corresponds to the fraudulent state transition in this case. Um, so that's the, all the information that the SDK needs in order to generate a fraud proof. Um, and moving on to the actual workflow of generate fraud proof, you um, so when you when you call generate generate fraud proof, the state in the SDK. Uh, at that point is after the fraudulent state transition has been executed. So we need to go back and revert um, to the last good state, which is right before the fraudulent state transition. Uh, so how we do that in that, this implementation is uh, you would just load the last committed state in the application, um, which is you can just load um, last commit state with a height. So you, after each commit that the state is um, sort of checkpointed into the application. So you can uh, load the last commit state in the application, execute all the non-fraudulent state transitions. There have been, which you, which you get using, which is what you're using these parameters for. Um, so now you are right before a fraudulent state transition. It's just a uh, yes necessary step in order to fast forward right before a uh, fraudulent state transition been executed, uh, and have this notion of uh, tracing. So in SD the SDK, there's trace KV uh, that you can enable, and it will write all the operations that are happening inside. Or the it, you can you can log off all the state that is being touched by the SDK, but uh, with the I for now for this implementation we added tracing inside the IAVL trees themselves, 
So there's tracing in the IBL trees, where when you once you enable tracing and execute the fraudulent straight transition, you would um, get tracing with sort logs of all the state that has been touched, all the key value pairs that have been touched during the state transition, uh, and it would also generate the corresponding Merkle inclusion proofs needed for each of the action that is being done uh, as part of the transaction or the, or the state transition. So uh, after you execute this fraudulent state transition, you get all the Merkle inclusion proofs needed. And these, are, these act as the state witnesses needed to re-execute this state transition later on. So for an example, like let's say this is a state transition submit guess for a certain app, and you have a bunch of different different actions there you would like you would need to read um, from some module uh, read write delete all those things so you would have Merkle inclusion proofs for each of these operations uh, in this case um, and these these will be saved inside the IAVL trees um, that have tracing enabled and after that, you would just retrieve these state witnesses from the corresponding uh, module IVL tree, um, and then do that process again of uh, fast forwarding to right before the fraudulent state transition was executed. And then you'll construct a state fraud proof with the current tree that you have, and you have the state witnesses that were generated earlier. So this is basically a, in all, it is just exporting partial state. It is uh, sort of trying to make a deep subtree, which is like a pa partial IAVL tree, which is needed, uh, the, the, min the minimal state that's needed to execute a particular state transition. Um, so that's kind of what the fraud group consists of. Um, so yes, this is what I have, um, for the fraud proof where you would have, um, the operation key values. These are the same things that I mentioned earlier. Just like, just have this as a slide. Um, so you would have Merkle proofs for, um, for each, for each Merkle root of a module. So you need to verify that, uh, let's say, uh, the staking modules Merkle root is included in the app hash that uh, I've been provided or that's been published on chain. And so I, I have a store level proof for, for the like a mo module level proof. And then for inside the modules, you have uh, proofs for each um, operation that was done in that um was done in that mo module so these are all the proofs you would need in order to do this one operation in a certain module uh like IAVL tree operation um so you would gossip these state fraud proofs so the prop proof is generated by a full mode you gossip it over p2p or you know use a use a DLA. Um, and moving on to verification, you uh, a light client, uh, which does not have a Cosmos SDK um, app running, would receive this fraud proof. It uh, so these are like the stages it would, I guess, technically need to go through in order to verify that this state fraud proof was constructed correctly. Uh, that someone's not just spamming and making invalid uh, fraud proofs. So you would check that the fraud proof itself has all the, like the, the ISRs inside the fraud proof are, you, you would cross check it with the actual chain, the data pu published on chain. Um, you would check uh, maybe that the fraud proof size is small enough so you can put all kinds of constraints there. Um, but the main parts here would be 
you would ver verify all the Merkle inclusion proofs are va valid. So the app hash that was published on chain, uh, you would verify that the there's the the store level Merkle inclusion proofs are valid. So which means the per module Merkle root was included uh, in that in the published app hash. And then now for each module, you would also ver verify that um, the for the first operation at least that those Merkle inclusion proofs are valid and part of the module Merkle root that we ver verified here. So there's like there's two levels of verification because we have two trees here, one tree for the multi-store, and then um, one tree each for each module. So these are just verifying the Merkle proofs. And then moving on, after this is done, then only you would spin up a new Cosmos SDK app. And using the contents of the prod proof, you have all the Merkle inclusion proofs. You can initialize a store with quote unquote deep subtrees, which is just a partial IAVL tree, which which we uh, we have like a implementation of, where which you can construct you using this witness data that we put in the state fraud proof. Uh, so the store, the Cosmos SDK app store, would has all the parts of the tree needed to execute this one state transition. Uh, and you could extend it to multiple state transitions later on, but for now, just have one state transition. And um, after you initialize it, the app hash representing the state of the app matches the pre state ISR, the app hash V uh, right before the fraudulent state transition was executed that we put in the straight for, for proof. And uh, so similarly, you just have a ABCI method here for the ABCI client where you would verify a prop, prop proof. This is called by the like client. Um, and for actually verifying it, it's that, that is simple now. You already have the state loaded in. You just need to execute the state transition and check the working app hash uh, and compare it against the expected app hash that is uh, put in the fraud proof, or I guess another way is to compare and see that the one that was published on chain is not the same. And that's another valid definition. And um, if it matches, then you have a uh, good fraud proof. And you, in that case, you can decide to halt and pay for an option social recovery process or whatever process the chain wants to use. So that is um the workflow total um yeah any questions about this uh, this isn't a question i'm sure yeah sorry go ahead marco no 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 you go ahead I just wasn't sure if this was a question. Oh, no, I, this wasn't a question, but just a comment. Uh, it feels like the ISR format can be useful for ZK proofs as well. You'd be able to kind of like parallelize um, the proving of an entire block uh, and recursively compose those. Um, so I feel like maybe the APIs can be generic, potentially generic. The ABCI methods can be generic to both, but I'm not sure if that's, uh, I haven't thought that through. Um. What, yeah, that, uh, what, what would make it like more generic in this case? Like, um, like not fraud proof specific. Fraud proof can be like a okay. like a one of field or something in like the, the request, but th that's not too important though. Yeah, I, I think, think it's good. Good. That's fine as well. No, that's definitely a good thing um, to bring up. Like, um, at least within the SDK, like we will um, look into making like um, fraud provability and like ISRs uh, like uh, with the SUSTI team will probably like uh, look at making it more of like a first class citizen. And so it'd be interesting to get your take on like how to make it more generalized for use cases like ZK as well. Yeah, 
yeah, that'd be super useful input. So, um, so also like um, I I got the presentation like also an hour ago, so that's why I have less questions. But um, something that like we talked about as well, like um, a lot of the current design that was just presented um, is due to uh, IBL's like. Uh, behavior of rotations um, and what i what i mean by rotations it means like the tree is self-balancing uh, after um, every right and so in this case like if you were to use something that did not have a balancing structure uh, balancing behavior something like a smt tree then um, this design could be simplified as well yeah in that in, in, in uh, so I initially implemented it with the SMT. Uh, in that case, you simplify it by instead of like doing it for all operations and having proofs for all operations, you would what you would do is where while generating a fraud proof, uh, you would only trace all the like the key value pairs that have been touched during. Um, during executing a state transition you would like keep track of all the things that have been touched um and then you would just have um like in in the witness data you would just have a key value pair and just a merkle inclusion proof or a non-inclusion proof if it's like a delete or if it's like like let's say there was a the new key that was introduced that was not already existing so you would just have uh one proof instead of like multiple proofs for each operation. So you don't need to go operation by operation. You just need to construct the, as long as you can construct like a load a deep subtree equivalent of whichever tree it is, um, you can, um, you, you have a valid fraud proof. Uh, yeah, so the, the, the key, I guess, takeaway is like we're, what we're, what the, the key challenge with this generating and verification was just uh, exporting partial uh, partial state from the existing store and loading that partial state in into like an empty app. Uh, so that's there's more steps with IAVL trees because of rebalancing and such. But uh, with SMTs, for example, that's easier. Uh, yeah. Interesting to hear from from you, Bo, as well. Like, um, like uh, I'm guessing, like you you were saying that ISR is in the in the context of zk mint. Um, is is that like a is that correct? Oh no, this is a just a general observation. We're we're not working on execution proofs at the moment. Um, that, that's it's, that's a later thing. I I would say. Oh, okay, awesome. Then yeah, like we we will be looking yeah. into it, but it's going to be. Uh, yeah, like a more of a phase two kind of kind of thing. Okay, awesome. Yeah, would love to like chat about that when it comes around, comes about, um, and then we can see about like supporting it, trying to uh, support it natively in the SDK as well. Yep. Has right, so anyone else have any questions or comments? Have you guys awesome. looked into any like sorry one, one point? Uh, have you guys looked yeah. into any witness compression schemes? Since I imagine like these subtrees may be um, uh, fairly fairly large. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think one thing we were considering um, was, for example, I think exploring it with like risk zero, seeing like using their um, using risk zero for like just compression instead of um, using it for like ZK specific things. Uh, but yeah, like that that's the main bottleneck for like these single round fraud proofs that the like the size can be large for the state witnesses. Right. So so you have to uh, uh, that's the one constraint you have to operate in. That's like the biggest thing. Yeah, yeah. Because um, yeah. I'm not sure exactly how Rissier would help here, um, but I was thinking along the lines of having some sort of like alternative cryptographic commitment. Um, like perhaps if 
the SDK were to explore like a like a like a vertical tree like commitment structure, um, something that can have succinct proofs with multiple openings, uh, that that may be helpful here. Yeah, I think the 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 storage, the the choice of um, store to use is definitely the one that like we, like experimenting with different stores can be a way to uh, try to um, you know make that witness size small. Other with IAVL trees, it's like definitely larger because cool. you have to go operations wise. But uh, yeah, I think work of, exploring workable trees can be interesting. Um, the quick question for myself on this front, so it's like I was talking um, to Dave and we were talking about the issue about like updating commitment structure and then having to like update, like if your chain that ends up migrating to SMT like completely or workable trees, then in that scenario, you have to update your like um, the chain, the chains that you connect to the IBC has to have to also update to like support it. So in this scenario, we were like kind of like talking about a potential world where it's like IBC state for provability is kept on IVL, but then the rest of the state machine can be moved to uh, a different commitment structure a lot faster. Um, does that kind of like jive with you, Bo, in that in what you were just mentioning, or would is it also like you would want to like see like IVL state move over alongside that? Yeah, have to think, think about it a little. Yeah, makes sense, makes sense. Um, yeah, I, I guess like also like a, an interesting thing, um, like in Q2, we're gonna like start some, like we're starting to store V2 refactor that's separating state storage and state commitment and then uh, probably mid to end the Q2, depending on the excitement of, um, of Dave. Um, I'm just gonna call, I'm just gonna put all the pressure on him now. Um, but uh, the, definitely the, the excitement. Um, on researching different commitment structures for like uh, Cosmos SDK and um, Cosmos and stuff, stuff like this. So we can start like experimenting and looking at different commitment structures, potentially not even only trees, potentially other stuff as well. We would love to have uh, both of you guys there, Manev and Bo. Awesome. If there's uh, just last call for questions, and then we can wrap up a few minutes earlier um, than expected. Awesome. Then let's wrap up a few minutes, uh, give everyone a few minutes back in this lovely springtime, um, and we can all go touch grass and have a good weekend. Ciao, ciao, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.